Well, hey, what's up, everybody? Matthew here. Thanks for checking into the YouTube channel. We're going to continue some discussions on the topic of baptism today. Of course, I've done several other videos on baptism and my Reformed View series and things like that. But today we're going to talk about a little bit of a controversy within Reformation thinking, and that is, what is the efficacy of baptism? In other words, does it have any saving potency itself? I was recently in a conversation and uh, the interviewer was asking me whether or not I could affirm that baptism saves. And of course, he was quoting from First Peter, baptism saves, pressing me a little bit on this topic. And I was a little bit hesitant to affirm that, even though it's right there in the Bible. And it's not because I deny what the Bible says. The Bible is, of course, inspired and infallible and inerrant. But I wanted to further qualify exactly what the text means when it talks about baptism saving. So what I'm going to do today is make an argument against baptismal regeneration or a view of baptism that would seem to suggest that the water in itself or baptism as such as an act of a sacrament actually has regenerating potency in the soul. And so we're going to look very carefully now together at this particular text that was quoted to me. And so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here and move over to a little bit of a teaching mode. Let's look at 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 to 22 together, and let's take some time to do some exegetical work here. This video might be a little bit longer, but I think that would be necessary in order to fill out our framework of how this text should be exegeted in its fullness. So first of all, let's read the text. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through water. Now here comes the key verse. 21. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you. Well, you should be able to affirm that, right? Matthew Everhart, it's right there in the Bible. Okay, let's continue reading here. Not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. That's 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 through 22. So uh, we can see where baptismal regeneration folks would make an argument or build an argument about the power of baptism as a sacrament from this line right here, verse 21, baptism, which corresponds to this now saves you. And in fact, sometimes even on Twitter, that line is uh, quoted as a full support for something, a doctrine approximating baptismal regeneration. Well, who couldn't affirm that? It's right there in the Bible. Okay, yeah, but... It does take a little bit of interpretive nuance, of course, to tease out exactly what Peter means when he says this. And not only that, but we're presented with a number of difficulties in this text. This is not exactly the easiest Bible text in the world. Of course, Scripture has the attribute of perspicuity, which means it is understandable, it is intelligible. But we often have to use um, the techniques of context clues and looking at the wording itself what grammar is provided by Peter to help us understand this? How is this statement affirmed and how is this statement denied in this context? Okay, so let's go through all of that here. And let's actually begin at the beginning because this is a, it's a difficult text, as I just said. Look at this verse. Now, I think this is one of the clearer verses in this passage, verse 18. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Okay, so this is a pretty clear statement on the imputation of his righteousness, uh, something to the effect of double imputation, perhaps even, that Christ imputes his righteousness to us, even as our sin was placed upon him at the cross. And so here, his suffering once for sins obviously refers to his crucifixion. Jesus died for us, the righteous, that would be Jesus, for the unrighteous, and that word for meaning something to the effect of instead of, or in place of, or to the benefit of the unrighteousness the unrighteous, excuse me, that he might bring us to God. Okay, well, that is the idea of reconciliation, that we're brought into relationship with God through his son, Jesus Christ. We might see something of adoption here, the idea of being brought to God or being reconciled to him in terms of our relationship, our enmity with him. We were once his enemies, is now destroyed by the cross as he brings us into relationship with himself and even into his family. 
being put to death in the flesh, which is an obvious um, reference there to Jesus's crucifixion. He fully died. He didn't just suffer on the cross, but he was actually killed on the cross in our place. And probably the only line here that's a little bit difficult is this one, but made alive in the spirit, which refers to his resurrection. A little bit of an unusual way to refer to his resurrection, though, being made alive in the spirit. Okay, so he was fully and truly resurrected. What's interesting about that line is you might think that Peter would say something about being made alive again in the body, because what makes the resurrection so powerful is, in fact, that it's a literal true resurrection in which Christ, having been killed on the cross and buried in in the tomb of the rich man, was actually literally and historically raised to life in his same self body at the resurrection. But here, Peter phrases it a little bit differently, but made alive in the spirit. Now that's going to, though, serve as something of a bridge to the very next thought here, which is a little bit more difficult in this passage. So let's move on to the next couple of verses here. In the spirit, in which, now I still have in the spirit highlighted here because that's going to qualify this phrase here, in which. So in which what? Well, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is eight persons were brought safely through water. Okay. So the, in which here is referring back to this previous statement from verse 18 in the spirit, it was in the spirit in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison. Now that opens up a kind of a Pandora's box of interpretive difficulties. In fact, this is a very difficult passage here, and it should give us some pause and a little bit of um, not hesitancy, but we want to be sure that we understand what this passage is before we move on to that line in 21, baptism saves you. Okay, so let's roll through a couple of options here, a couple, three options in which some people have looked at that previous text. First, some have said, and I think this is wrong, that this text here is arguing for some sort of second chance for those who are in Hades or Sheol. It seems to suggest, and let's just go back to it for a minute, um, that he, Christ, in his spirit is proclaiming what? Proclaiming hope, the gospel, to spirits in prison because they formerly did not obey. And so some people would take this text and say, well, this is a proof text for some sort of second chance after death for those who would otherwise be consigned to hell, in which Christ, by his spirit, goes and proclaims the gospel to them so that they might be sprung free from what is called here uh, this prison, okay, and somehow released, perhaps maybe some sort of doctrine of purgatory or something like that here. But um, that is not the intention of this passage to suggest that there is some sort of second chance after death. And in fact, I think that's a highly dubious way to interpret this text, given that the Bible nowhere indicates that there's any kind of second chance or a secondary opportunity for people to repent and believe once their fate is sealed at death. Now, others have taken this text to indicate something of Christ's descent into hell. And I've done a couple of videos on um, on the descent into hell, so I'm just going to refer you to those videos. But the third option, then, is the option that I'm actually going to hold to, and that is that what's being said here is that Jesus preached the gospel by the Holy Spirit when? Through Noah in his day at the time of the flood. So I'm going to eliminate possibility one and eliminate possibility two. These are not the correct interpretation of 1 Peter chapter 3. Instead, and we're going to read this again here, the preferred interpretation is that Jesus Jesus preached the gospel, how? By the Holy Spirit, okay, because he was not yet incarnated in the flesh, okay, that would come many centuries, indeed millennia later, by the Holy Spirit through Noah at the time of the flood. That's the correct interpretation, and I believe that is pretty clearly the reformed interpretation of this text. Okay, so again, let's have a look at it again. Jesus, this Christ here, made alive in the Spirit as his resurrection, in which he went, now this is a past tense, okay, so we're referring now back to something that happened much, uh, much uh, time ago. He went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, that's a reference to hell, because they formerly did not obey. Again, we're talking about something that happened a long time ago, not something that happened right between 
uh, the cross and the resurrection of Jesus. No, the writer here, Peter, is talking about something that happened ages ago. When, another indication of time language, God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which that a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. Okay, so um, the short interpretation of this then is that Jesus Christ, by his same Holy Spirit, third person of the Trinity, yes, he preached the gospel in the days of Noah to those who were ultimately then lost. They did not respond favorably. In fact, they rejected the gospel that was as it was offered to them, and thus they were judged through this water cataclysm, this water judgment, which is the flood. Nevertheless, here in this text, Noah and eight persons were brought safely through water. So even though there is a water judgment in the days of the flood, yet nevertheless, God, by his grace, saved Noah and his family, they being brought through safely through the water. Okay, so that is the context in which the next verse, our key verse here, comes up. So let's move on to it here. Now, Again, we want to highlight just a little bit of the previous verse, because these verses are not to be taken in isolation. And so those of you who would just want to quote verse 21, you're missing a little bit of the context here. And that's, of course, one of the first and easiest ways to make an interpretive mistake is to isolate a verse from its whole context. Brought safely through water. Now, here we go, 21. Baptism, which corresponds to this. Okay, we're going to look at the word corresponds here, because this happens to be the key word in the text now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Okay, so let's look at this a little bit more carefully here. First of all, we're going to notice that we have a water judgment here being referred to in the days of Noah. And in the same way, now we're going to shift from water to water. See the connection here from the flood in the times of Noah to now baptism. Okay, so what in the world does the flood have to do with baptism? Well, here we need to know a little bit of the Greek. And unfortunately, if you're just working from an English translation, um, use as many translations as you can, use as many tools as you can, but sometimes a little bit of Greek helps here. So the I'm going to interpret this. And you, okay, ha, kai, humas, and you, an anti-type now saves baptism. That'd be a literal rendering here. Ha, kai, humas, anti tupan nun sodze baptisma. Okay, it's a little bit out of order, and of course, Greek works out of order compared to English. English is highly dependent on word order here, but a rough translation again would be, and you, an anti-type now saves baptism. Okay, baptism saves you now as an anti-type. Okay, so what in the world is an anti-type? You probably understood every word in that translated into English except for the word anti-type. Well, an anti-type here corresponds with a type. A type and an anti-type work together. Um, a type is a person, place, or thing which stands for a meaning that is much greater than itself and will later be fulfilled or explained. Okay, so an anti-type here speaks to the idea of correspondence or likeness or similitude or agreement. Okay, so the Bible speaks a lot of anti-types and anti-types, although the words themselves are not used all that terribly often. In fact, I think the only other time that the word uh, anti-tupon or anti-tupos, anti-type is used as in the book of Hebrews, in which, again, a person, place, or thing finds a greater fulfillment, especially in the gospel. So, for instance, here in this text, we might think of Christ as the greater ark. The ark saves the elect by grace through faith, just as Christ saves the elect by grace through faith. Or we might think of how Christ is the fulfillment of the temple, the temple being the place where the people of God go to meet God, the place where ultimate sacrifice is laid down. So Christ is greater than the temple itself. Christ is greater than the tabernacle. Christ is the greater Moses. Christ is the greater David. Christ is the greater Isaac, the son who uh, was sacrificed or would have been sacrificed in Isaac's case. And yet again, there is the ram who is another type of Christ. And so the Bible uses a lot of typological language here to speak of correlation. Okay, so there's something in, of likeness or agreements between the one and in the other. And in this case here, what is the type and the anti-type? Well, the type here, going back to this, is the floodwaters. 
And the anti-type now is baptism, which corresponds to this. Okay, so that's the best that ESV can do. I wish it would have used the language of type and anti-type here, because I do think that it triggers somebody to think a little bit more deeply about this. And this is, of course, why so many people miss the main point of this passage here by just jumping to 21 and saying, oh, well, baptism has saving efficacy in and of itself. No, it's spoken here of a anti-type to the flood waters of the judgment. Okay, so in what way then is baptism an anti-type of the type of the ark and the saving through the flood? Well, clearly here we have a lot in common, though not everything in common here. Though we have certainly a statement of grace and faith and a savior. Okay, so Noah was saved by grace. He placed his faith in the Lord and the Lord saved him. Same thing too with baptism. Baptism uh, is clearly a, a glorious depiction of grace, okay, the washing away of our sin depicted here by water. Faith, of course, we trust in Christ as a Savior, and ultimately baptism points us to the Savior himself, not the saving power of the water as a sacrament necessarily, but the way that the water points to the Savior. And just as Noah in his time was saved from a judgment, that judgment being the floodwaters themselves. So we are saved by the judgment, which will ultimately be condemnation to hell if we're not repentant of our sins. So Christ here is something like the ark who saves us. And the correspondence or the type anti-type here is that we are safe through the water. Okay. So baptism pictures a number of things, for instance, resurrection, Romans chapter six, right? But here, baptism is also used as a picture of being saved through the water in the same way that Noah was saved by grace through faith in God's saving power in the ark. So also believers experience salvation through the water, as it were. Okay, so there is a great correspondence then between Noah and baptism, and that's exactly the correlation that Peter is trying to draw out here. Now, here, Peter is going to deny something and then affirm something else. And so this, again, is very, very key to understanding this idea of baptism now saves you. Okay, I hope that you're still with me in this video because this is, after all, the main point. Notice here in verse 21 that Peter, first of all, makes a denial. So this denial is a clarification to prevent misunderstanding from taking place. And I would argue the very misunderstanding that so many people have when they read this text and stop short of looking at it in its context, which just drives me nuts here. So, no, the verse doesn't just say baptism saves you. It goes on, doesn't it? It says, baptism, which corresponds to this type, anti-type, now saves you, but not as a removal of dirt from the body. Okay, so Peter is very clear to say here that we're not talking about the physical act of baptism, i.e. baptism with water, as in baptismal regeneration. Peter is clearly disabusing us of this view. He doesn't want us to think that it's the baptism qua baptism or the baptism as such that actually has the saving efficacy upon the soul. But no, what does the physical water do? Well, not much more than remove dirt from the body. So Peter is very clear here in his manner of expression. Remember, we've already used typological language, which is a, a literary figure of speech, now he's going to be super clear that we don't take him literally and say not as a removal of dirt from the body. So the saving power is not in the water itself, which is what the Westminster Confession of Faith teaches, I think, so clearly. Well, how then? In what way does baptism point to salvation? Well, by this. But, okay, so we have a contrast here, but contrasting this new phrase from the previous, just having gone before it, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is another way of talking about inward repentance of sin and faith in Jesus Christ. Remember, the Reformed always talk about the sign and the thing signified, the sign here being water, the thing signified being here, the cleansing uh, that Christ gives us in the gospel. And how do we apprehend that? Well, don't forget your ref your reform doctrine, justification by grace alone through faith alone. And so this is the way Peter says it, as an appeal. So what is an appeal? 
or I think the New King James has it as an answer, okay? It's a response, okay? And what are we doing? We're pleading and to appeal to God is to plead or to ask or to request or even perhaps to beg him, okay? So we appeal to God for a good conscience. Now, what is a good conscience? A good conscience is a clean conscience. A good conscience is one that has been freed from guilt, and so here we're using the language of repentance. He doesn't use the word metanoia, as we might expect, but he says it in another way, appeal to God for a good conscience. So if I were to, to appeal to God, Lord, please give me a good conscience, what would I be saying? I'd be saying, God, please forgive me. Lord, take away my guilt. Lord, take away my shame. And how then do I get that good conscience? Well, he points us right back to Jesus Christ through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Okay. So what we're having here is not a text that speaks of baptismal efficacy unto the regeneration of the soul. Okay. Though we might disagree here with our Lutheran and Catholic friends who would hold that view, but rather we have a very clear text. I mean, if ever there was a clear text to suggest that the water itself doesn't have saving power, but rather by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And the means of obtaining that here is repentance and appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Okay, so let's go ahead and finish up the verse. Who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. So here we end up with something of a statement of the ascension of Christ and his kingship, his present rulership. In other words, as the reigning king at the right hand of the Father, he has power and prerogative to grant the appeal. He can answer the, the prayer. In fact, he does answer the prayer. So we have here a very strong statement in this text of the glory of the gospel and the correspondence by way of illustration of Noah and the flood and baptism corresponding to the flood, which all in context points to the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. So this passage is not a passage that speaks of the power of baptismal efficacy unto regeneration of the soul, but rather the whole thing is a passage which points to the power of the gospel in Christ. So if I could paraphrase it rather briefly, I would say, you are saved by the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, by grace through faith, as pictured in baptism, just as truly as Noah was saved by the ark. Okay, so that would be my paraphrase of this text. All right. Now, let's just see how the Reformed have actually interpreted this text in the past, and I'm just going to draw for you a couple of examples of this. The first will be the Westminster Confession itself, and this is taken from 28.6. And uh, here in the footnotes, the Westminster Divine Site, 1 Peter 3, our very text here, although I should add that the footnotes that we use today, for instance, in this uh hardback edition of the OPC and PCA edition may be at variance from what the Westminster Divines used as their proof text. I know the Divines definitely did add proof text. This one, though, I think might have been the proof text added by a committee on the OPC or the PCA. So that notwithstanding, here's what the Westminster Confession says in 28.6. The efficacy of baptism is not tied to the moment, okay, I get that right here, not tied to that moment of time wherein it is administered, yet notwithstanding, by the right use of this ordinance, the grace promised is not only offered, but really exhibited and conferred by the Holy Ghost to such, whether of age or of infants, as that grace belongeth unto, according to the counsel of God's own will in his appointed time. Okay, so the Westminster Confession of Faith is not a memorialist statement. Okay, it's not Zwinglian, and, and, and Zwingli probably wasn't even Zwinglian either by by our common usage and definitions. Memorialist position meaning that it's just a remembrance, it's just an illustration, uh, it's nothing more than just a bare sign. But no, the Westminster Confession of Faith actually does speak of efficacy of baptism, but not the kind of regenerative efficacy that our Lutheran friends speak of, okay? The efficacy of baptism. So there is an efficacy. Yes, the efficacy of baptism is not tied to that moment of time wherein it's, it's administered, yet notwithstanding, by the right use of this ordinance, the grace promised is not only offered. Okay, so we're talking about real grace here, but really exhibited. I like that word here because it talks about being shown or demonstrated. Baptism is a picture, after all, of what 
grace is like. It's like the washing of the body through baptism and conferred by the Holy Spirit. Okay, so there really is grace involved here. It's not just a bare sign, but not in the same way that our Lutheran friends would look at it. Okay, how about Francis Turretin from the Institutes? This is uh, book three, page 379, at least according to the uh, Banner of Truth editions. Francis Turretin says, thus Peter clearly distinguishes the baptism by which the filthiness of flesh is washed away externally from that which consists internally in the answer of a good conscience, 1 Peter 3.21. Just as Paul distinguishes a twofold circumcision, citing Romans and Colossians, one of the flesh and letter, the other of the spirit in the heart. Okay, so here Francis Turretin is no doubt referring to that ancient definition of a sacrament as an external sign of an inward grace. Notice that language here. External sign, something that can be seen and perceived by the senses, the eyes, the ears, you can hear the water, you can touch it with your hands, but actually indicating something internally, standing for the internal grace. And here uh, Francis Turretin makes a very apt and I think entirely appropriate comparison just as Paul distinguishes twofold circumcision, one of the flesh and one of the heart. And of course, in Romans 2 and Colossians 2, Paul says we must be circumcised of the heart, not just of the flesh. And by the way, that's an emphasis that the prophets would often put on circumcision as well. Okay, so that's Turretin and his institutes. Here's John Calvin speaking on the same text. Peter also says that baptism also doth now save us. Well, there's that Twitter ready verse, right? It's just ready to be tweeted out. Baptism saves. But but what does Calvin say here? For he did not mean to intimate that our ablution and salvation are perfected by water, or that water possesses in itself the virtue of purifying, regenerating, and renewing. Nor does he mean that it is the cause of salvation. But look at this. But only that the knowledge and certainty of such gifts are perceived in the sacrament. This, the words themselves, evidently show, okay? So Calvin's interpretation is just the same one that I've labored to give you already in this video. And finally, let's wrap up here with some Matthew Henry, a great Presbyterian. Did you know he was so chubby, though? Look at those cheeks. My goodness, just want to pinch those cheeks, Matthew Henry. Declares what he means by saving baptism. Not the outward ceremony of washing with water, which in itself does no more than put away the filth of the flesh, but it is that baptism wherein there is a faithful answer or restipulation of a resolved good conscience, engaging to believe in and be entirely devoted to God, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, renouncing at that same time the flesh, the world, and the devil. The baptismal covenant made and kept will certainly save us. Yes, that is true. The baptismal covenant will certainly save us. Washing is the visible sign. This is the thing signified. All right. Well, hopefully that clarifies a little bit about 1 Peter chapter 3, baptism now saves us. So don't be uh, uh, don't be too hasty to quote only a piece of a verse. Make sure to quote the entire thing. It's a more faithful interpretation that way. All right. Thank you so much for checking into this video. Do love you lots, and we'll talk to you later.